Sundays. I'm not going to come to church, and I'm not judging anyone that does this, but I'm for me, I'm not going to come to church in jeans or shorts or whatever. I'm coming dressed up because I'm giving my best to God because he gave his best to me. In Genesis 4, verses 3 to 4, it said again, In the course of time, grain brought, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. He offered just the fruit of the land, not the best, not even the first fruit. He was not particular. He just did his duty. Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn. He gave the fat, the best. He gave the firstborn. He didn't hold it back. He didn't say, no, I'm keeping this, this, this prized lamb or this prized cow. We don't tell, we're not told exactly what kind of animal he offered. But he didn't, I'm not keeping this one for myself. I can you know, rear him and breed him and get better, you know, better and better. No, he gave the best that he had. I'm sure he trusted God would provide in the following year another fatted firstborn that he could offer. So one of the themes that in the Bible is that God seeks worship, he seeks worship from the heart, but he seeks a worship that costs us. It's got to be the best. He doesn't settle for second choice. Now, what is our worship? We don't worship like the Jews did back in those days. We don't do offerings. We don't do. We don't slay animals. We don't bring a cow up here on the on the altar and cut it open and have blood run all over. We don't do that anymore. Thank God, it'd be a messy place if we did, wouldn't it? <laughs> Probably stinking here too. But one person shed his blood for us as a final offering, and we know that person was Jesus Christ. So what is our worship today, besides the singing of songs and coming to church on Sundays? Primarily, even outside the church, our worship goes on. Because worship is primarily our lifestyle. It's who we are. Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your, bo offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. When he says offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, thank God he didn't say offer it as a dead sacrifice. Oh, we don't have to kill ourselves to please God. We do it as a living sacrifice. What we do out of our worshiping -like lifestyle, using our talents, being committed to God, giving to God, and service to others, not just in the church, but out in the world. Second Samuel 24, 24 said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. That's the spirit of worship. When your sacrifice is involved in your worship, you know it's going to cost you, but you do it anyway. And we know in this world today that just being a Christian can cost us. And there's coming a day when just being a Christian may cost us our lives, literally. Um... So being a Christian and serving the Lord is costly. How many of you are willing to pay the cost? I like to say I'm willing to pay the cost. And I hope when that day comes <laughs> that I actually stand there and say I'm going to pay, pay the cost. You know, many Christians say they will, but when they're faced with a at the point, you know, gun pointed at them, they're probably ready to give up. It's going to be hard times for us coming in this world. So we need to make it firm in our spirit of whether we're willing to pay the cost and serve the Lord, even if it means our life is literally sacrificed. Malachi 1, 6-9 said, A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a, uh, if I'm a father, where is the honor due me? And if I'm a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you priests who show contempt for my name. You ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. When you offer blind animals for the sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord. Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you? says the Lord Almighty. In other words, we don't give him just a minimum. We give him the best. 
If we expect God to be pleased with us, we want to give him the best in all that we do. Psalm 96, verse 9 says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. That doesn't mean that we're fearful of the Lord. We love the Lord. But we stand in awe and respect of him. And therefore, we worship him. And he's holy. And holiness that we could never attain to. But because of what he's done for us, we attain that holiness and we can worship in the splendor of holiness. Worship with the right motives. Our motives matter to God. Proverbs 16.2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Jeremiah 17.10, I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. And Proverbs 21.2 says, A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. So our motives are important. Our motives matter to God. God's not impressed with those who do the right thing for the wrong reasons. He, what matters to him is the person who does the right thing despite the reason. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I don't want the Lord ever to say that about me. Sometimes people can have very bad motives for doing good things. But doing good things with the right motive, with a pure heart, is what pleases the Lord. There's a story about a man who was riding in a car, in, in an uh, uh, Uber perhaps, and the driver slowed down to avoid hitting a pedestrian. And the passenger com complimented him, saying, I know she slowed down for that fellow. And the driver says, well, yeah, if I hit him, I'd go to jail. So his concern was not about the person. His concern was not going to jail. His motive was wrong. His heart was wrong about it. It would have been better if he said, yeah, I don't want to take a life. I you know, slow down to make you know, sure he was safe, not just so I won't go to jail. What are your motives for serving the Lord? Every so often we need to do a motivation checkup. Check up on what our motivations are. Why am I doing what I'm doing? The lesson from Cain and Abel is that God does care about our motives. We need to be aware of our motives. And we need to be aware that our motives matter to God. And we trust, we must not be content with a life that's driven by selfish motives. We must not be content with a life that's driven by just enough to get by. All, we need to give it all, give their best. As we continue our story, we see Cain had become very upset and angry. And Genesis 6, 4, 6 to 8, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Ah. <sighs> He was angry. Anger can cause us to do things that when we're in our right mind, we wouldn't do. It'll cause us to say things that if we're not angry, we wouldn't say. We wouldn't dream of saying. But sometimes our anger takes control of our minds. It takes control of our mouth, unfortunately. And in this case, he's, he begins to complain to God. He's angry at God. You know, you didn't accept my offering. You accepted Cain's you accepted Abel's, but you didn't accept mine. I have a right to be mad. You didn't do deal fairly with me. I'm paraphrasing, of course. So they go out to the field. Cain said to brother, his brother, let's go out to the field. Why do you imagine he said, let's go out to the field? He wanted to go somewhere where no one could see what he was going to do. He wanted to hide what he was going to do. I guarantee you, you can't hide your sin from God. There's nowhere you can go that you can hide your sin from God. God's going to find out, he's going to know, and he's going to get you for it. <laughs> and while he was out in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now, it was certainly not Abel's fault that Cain's sacrifice wasn't pleasing to God. What did Abel have to do with it? Why should Cain be mad at Abel? 
It wasn't that he was mad at Abel. He was mad at God. But he was jealous of Abel. Jealousy is another thing that can cause us to do things that in our right minds we would not do. Cain directs anger and jealousy and even to the point of hatred against his, towards his brother. Hatred to such a point that he actually killed his brother. And most people are afraid of the law if they actually kill a person. But you know, back then there was no police department to come after Cain. <laughs> there wasn't any detectives out there to investigate who did this murder. And in fact, there was no laws on the book back then except the law that is written in the heart of man. And he knew that it was wrong to kill, but he did it anyway. There was no one around, though, to prevent his hatred from turning into murder. After all, he was out in the field, away from Adam and Eve, thinking he could get by with it without being found out. How do we deal with anger? I doubt there's anyone in here who has ever gone so far as you've killed anybody, is there? Pastor Roy, have you? Yeah. There's some people I probably came close to think, wishing I could, but <laughs> none of us have actually gone that far in our anger. I do believe uncontrolled anger can be very destructive. Some of you may remember several months ago that I had anger at a certain person and I was struggling to forgive that person. I finally did forgive them, turn it over to the Lord, but that anger still resided in my heart for a long time. And I think that's probably a lot of what was behind the health issues I had last year because I would continue to carry that anger. So anger can not only destroy others, it can destroy ourselves. A man wrote a letter to his insurance company and said, whenever I get angry, Close my eyes and count to ten. And I was driving down the freeway and I remembered I was mad at my wife. So I closed my eyes, counted to ten, and the next thing I know, I was in a crash. Well, needless to say, the insurance company didn't accept that excuse. A woman said to her pastor, well, I occasionally lose my temper, but I get over it quickly. And pastor replied, well, a gun fires and causes death and it gets over quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anger can harm one's health in addition to other people, as I said. It's been proven that angry people die younger than those who are able to deal with their anger and deal with their frustration. Anger destroys relationships. I've known people who claim to be Christians who don't even ever speak to each other because of the anger that has festered for years. I'm not going to name a name, but I, it, I know that that hurts people. There's a, a, a person here in this church who got angry at me about something, and although I apologize, they refused to talk to me ever since then. Um, they've not forgiven. Uh, I don't know if they're still angry at me or what, but they won't talk to me anymore. Again, I put them in God's hands. Um, if he had bottled up anger... Whether it's something that happened today or something happened long ago, it's going to affect your relationship with others as well as your health. Kids may be mad at their mom or dad because they won't let them do something they want to do. Maybe they want to go out with a friend and the parents don't want them to because they know they shouldn't be hanging with this particular friend or whatever the reason may be. The parents deny them the permission to go out with their friend. And so the kids get angry. Maybe it's somebody who did something to us years ago. Perhaps a neighbor, perhaps someone at the church. Somebody took advantage of you or cheated you. And he causes a bitter attitude. Whatever type of anger it is, we need to get control of it. We need to master it. Otherwise, it's not only going to affect our relationships with others, but it could kill us as well. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to get angry. In fact, Ephesians tells us, be angry but sin not. We can be angry. Jesus was angry with the people in the temple when he overthrew the, the tables. But the Bible tells us, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil a foothold. 
We need to resolve the anger as soon as possible. Well, Cain resolved the anger, but not in the way that <laughs> was honorable to God. God warned him about it. He says, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And he didn't master it. He allowed it to master him. And so he slew Abel. Uncontrolled anger and jealousy resulted in Abel's death and destroyed Cain's life too. God drew, drew, drove him away. I can imagine Adam and Eve were expecting the two boys to come back from the field that day. And neither one of them came back. And I imagine they were worried. They probably went out looking for him. Imagine when they came across Abel's body. And then Cain didn't come home either because God drove him away. So there was a loss for Adam and Eve. They lost both their boys in one day. One to death and one because he caused the death and was driven away from the presence of God and driven out of the land, the Bible tells us. After he killed his brother, Cain behaved as if nothing had happened. But Cain's crime was discovered by God. God said to him, where is your brother Abel? Cain didn't admit his guilt. He says, how do I know? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? God can't be fooled. He knows what he did. The Lord says, what have you done? Now, God didn't ask him that because he didn't know what he'd done. He knew what he had done. He asked him that because he needed Abel to, I mean, he needed Cain to confess what he did. But Cain didn't confess it. He says, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Imagine that, his blood crying out to him. That's how seriously God treats first-degree murder. It was something that was offensive to him. The blood was crying out to him. I imagine God feels the same way about abortion. I imagine God feels the same way about anything that causes death to another that is not natural cause. The blood of the victim cries out to God, and God hears it. Now, of course, it's not an audible calling out. Not, not something that can be heard. But God knows, and it affects God. He created human beings, after all. He created life, and he didn't create it for life to be taken away by another person. He didn't create it so we can abort babies. He didn't create it so we can murder people. He didn't create it so we can kill people. He created it so we could have life and share life together. So... Death other than natural death, I believe, is a high offense to God. Sin can't be covered up. It can be hidden from people, but not from God. Sin cannot be sealed, uh, he healed, concealed. I'll get that word out. <laughs> Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. Numbers 32, 23 says, If you fail to do this, you'll be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure your sin will find you out. Luke eight seventeen. There is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out in the open. God knows. We can't hide it from him, even though we may be very good at hiding it from others. The one who counts, God, knows it, knows it all. The Lord then tells him a punishment for his crime. Excuse me. He says, now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened his mouth to receive your brother, brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops to you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Now imagine this. This is all he had known all his life, was tilling the ground, planting crops, from sowing, harvesting, sowing, reaping. That was his life's work. And now God tells him, you're not going to be doing that anymore. The ground's not going to produce for you. You might work the land, you might plant the seeds, but you're not going to get anything out of it. And you're going to be a restless wanderer on the earth. Everywhere you, you're just going to be wandering. So he couldn't go back home. 
And that's why Adam and Eve lost both sons in one day. I can't imagine lo losing my one son, let alone both my kids, in one day. But note Cain's degradation and his temptation. He was angry, he was jealous, he hated, he killed, he lied, and finally he was cursed. Jesus said anyone who is angry with a brother or sister is subject to judgment. And anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. God considers hate as murder. We don't actually have to actually kill somebody. But to hate somebody in our heart is viewed, at, viewed as, by God as murder. Why? Because, as I said before, we're all God's creation. He created us to have fellowship with one another, not to hate each other, not to murder each other. Sin has many consequences, but what primarily does is separate us from God. Isaiah 59.2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Not only will he not look at us, because he's separated from us, but he won't hear us. Our prayers are going to go nowhere when, we, when we're living in sin. Sin leads, leads to self-destruction. We know that down the line, Lot and his family chose to go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they started a lifestyle of what they knew around them in their environment, which was wicked. And the anger of the Lord rose against them, and they were destroyed. Sin leads to eternal death. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. Sin has serious consequences. It was so much so, so grievous, so burdensome to Cain, that Cain said to God, my punishment's more than I can bear. Some believed that Cain was repenting. I don't think he was repenting. I think he was continuing to complain. You're putting this on me? <laughs> this more than I can bear. That's not fair, God. Why are you doing this to me? I mean, I was angry. You didn't honor my sacrifice. I had, you know, he's justifying himself. And now he says, no, this punishment's not fair. Whatever the case, God chose to show mercy to Cain. He promises to protect him and not allow anyone to kill him. As I mentioned in the beginning of this, his concern was somebody's going to kill me now that I'm a wanderer. He wasn't concerned about the fact that he killed his brother. He was concerned about somebody's going to kill him. But God was merciful and says, I won't allow anyone to kill you. And anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times owner. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one found him, so that anyone who found him would not kill him. Now, we don't know what that mark was. The Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know if it was a physical mark, a tattoo. I, I doubt it. <laughs> but God marked him in some way. There was a distinguishing physical mark so that he wouldn't be harmed. Sin has serious consequences, but God always offers forgiveness. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, even if you have murdered someone... If you turn to Jesus Christ, you'll find freedom and forgiveness. Some people think that murder is a, a sin that cannot be forgiven. There's not any sin out there except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that God will not forgive. We think murder is a pretty serious sin, and it is. It's taking of an innocent life. But God looks at all sin equally. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, even if we murdered our brother or sister if we turn to Christ we'll be free from and find full forgiveness 1 John 1 9 says if we confess our sins he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness Hebrews 12 24 to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant and the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel all you have to do is put your trust and confidence in, in the Lord. This is perhaps the most magnificent teaching in the Bible, that no matter what we've done, God is there to offer forgiveness. I believe that, and I thank God for that, because I know I would be in a world of hurt 
if God has not forgiven me of some of the things I did, and I bet everyone sitting here has something like that they feel in their heart as well. Sin has consequences, but God forgives. But forgiveness does not remove the consequences. Both statements are just as true. There's consequences and there's forgiveness. Even though we're forgiven, we may face the consequences. As Christians, we need, need to learn to keep that in balance because we, many people think, I can sin, God will forgive me. But they forget about the part, I can sin, but I'm gonna have consequences. No, we're gonna have consequences regardless of forgiveness. Thank God for forgiveness, and actually, we can thank God for the consequences too. If we don't have the consequences, we don't learn. That's the purpose of the consequences. So I pray that we learn to keep those two truths in balance. And I pray that we learn to make our worship true from the heart, worship in faith with pure motive. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons that these two brothers teach us through this tragic death, Lord. Their worship, their sacrifice to you, their offerings, teach us a truth, Lord, that our offering must be in faith, and it must be with a pure motive, and it must be given our best. It must not be second place. It must not be anything that doesn't cost us. Father, thankfully, we don't have to do blood sacrifices anymore. Jesus was the blood sacrifice for us, and we thank you and glorify you and worship you for that. We're grateful to you for that, Lord. Lord, our sacrifice is our lifestyle. Help us to live in a way that's worthy of calling, and may our life be a life of worship to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Appreciate that, brother Eugene. Amen. What a, what a awesome teaching. Amen. The mercies of God. Amen. In all of this. All to Jesus I surrender all to Him. I